the recording is started and uh, welcome to strategic marketing once again um, so we are talking about what project should we have for this course if you if you are not here still you can see this so that you know what project we are we will be doing for so what i have thought is that instead of uh, we were first having presentation but instead of that uh let's have uh, uh some uh we can say a kind of uh, review uh report what i'll uh, ask you to do is that you pick up uh, a topic a section of uh, the course which is which is under the course outline and search for at least three case studies related to that you search three case studies and then uh, you study those case studies these those studies case studies should be at least uh, you know 10 pages long it should not be mini case studies of one paragraph or two paragraph comprehensive case studies about the topic uh, they can be global they can be local it, it doesn't matter and then you make a review report which means you consolidate your learning from three case studies and give a review report on that case study just like a review article it it talks about other articles what mentioned in them and uh, what they do so you are also going to write a review report consolidating combining the learning from key different case study and that will be a report so you can do that at home you can study these articles and then you can summarize them consolidate them and then make a report on that that will be your uh, final uh, submission as a project that will be for 10 marks the other assignments that i will give you uh, are all are going to be of 20 marks that makes them 30 10 will be of quiz that makes it 40 and the rest of 60 will be the final exam that's how the grading will be uh, No. Yes. Sir, a question. Okay. Go ahead. Sir, so, question is that the review report is it a group report or an individual report? Uh, I think it was. Uh, uh, did we make groups in the first place? I think we did. Okay. Is it a group report? Yes, if you made groups for the presentation, then this is the same, so you will be doing it with the same group. Okay. Three people maximum. And, uh. Sir, just that you, uh, four people. You allowed us four, four people. No, four people are too much. Actually, this can be done individually as well, but I'm just, uh, doing this so that you can study one case study properly. Give your review and then you can combine. Otherwise, this is something that you can do individually as well. Then we can make it four case studies, huh? four people. Okay, go ahead. Do that. And if anyone wants oh. to do individually, they can but do that. Doesn't mean that uh, you. you can increase that number arbitrarily. Doesn't mean that you can add one and say that we are going with five people, even five people, or six people and six case studies. Okay, so uh, that we can allow to fold, but not more than that. So you uh, select a topic and uh, post that topic on Google Classroom so that I know that you don't have the same topics for everybody. If there are any topics that are common, then I'll look it up and look uh, look about it, what to do about it. Um, so if I say, for example, a person is doing individually, so an individual person has to go over three case studies, or just one or two will be suffice. No, no, three is the minimum, because you cannot consolidate your learning if you haven't gone through three, at least three case studies will actually uh, improve your learning about things. Okay, so look at, yeah, 
and uh, try to go with uh, the same uh, industry case studies. For example, if you are choosing FMCGs, then uh, pick three FMCGs, uh, FMCG case studies. We are going for pharma, pick three pharma case studies. Try to do that. Or at least they, are, they should be related because you will not be able to match the case studies of, um, let's say, the uh, an automobile industry with the insurance industry or um, um, maybe um, education industry and FMCG industry. So you will not be able to uh, combine these studies, consolidate these studies because they will be way apart. They, they will have a big difference. So try to go with... Sir, sir I am from investing industry. Sorry? I am from the banking industry, should I choose from my industry one or two case studies? Yes, you can. But go for similar. Go for uh, other case studies that are related. For example, insurance is related, uh, stock exchange is related. Um, all these kinds of strategies are, uh, uh, our industries are related. Try to do that if possible. Sir, uh, just okay. join. Uh, sir, please repeat for the next bar. You can see it on. Uh, this is being recorded. You can just view it later on YouTube. I'll I'll send you a link on YouTube. Okay, sir. Thank you. So, um, the ones who are here, you understand what we have to do. In short, I'll I'll just sum it up. You have to make a review report, taking three case studies. And um, uh, from your from related industries, consolidate the learning into one review report. I'll send you a, a template, a kind of a, a guideline for the things that you need to include in that report, so that you know what to do. Okay. So um, that's it. Uh, I'll be sending you some assignments as well. There will be uh, a quiz uh, too uh, related to this session that we are going to have today. So do that. G. Uh, Ahmed, you're seeing something? Yes, sir. Actually, it's a request. You said that uh, this would be of 10 marks, and there uh, will be another assignment of 20 marks. So can't it be possible that we just get the 30 marks within this assignment? Because if I'm doing individual and I'm going over three, uh, you know, articles and I'm summarizing it, so I think this would be enough if it's any way possible. Uh, it is very much possible for me, but it's not possible for HEC because they want a different heads of the assignment. They want at least two assignments and a project and or presentation and uh, quizzes. Uh, if it were for me, I would have given you a big project of 40 marks and, and that's it. So uh, it's not up to me that's the problem. They, the SEC, in fact, they are even more particular about what we are doing right now because uh, we are having online sessions and they are very... Uh, concerned about uh, what, how we are disseminating this uh, learning sessions and what are we doing with assignments and quizzes. So, uh, so they are very particular about that. That's why we need to have some assignment. Don't worry, they will not be very difficult or long assignments. They will probably be uh, very short, half page, one page assignments, so that you can, you don't have much time to do that. More learning, less writing. Okay. Okay. So um, let's start with the today's um, topic. Uh, last time we discussed the pricing strategies, and I believe we uh, we uh, we pretty much covered the whole topic. So we know that if we have to go for pricing strategies, we uh, need to do, we need to uh, have a pricing policy and then we have to have a pricing strategy and then we can use those pricing methods 
to lay down our uh, strategy in action. And that uh, we discussed many of the possible possible uh, strategies that we can use. So if you haven't watched that video, I suggest you do. I'll put up a, a, a link here and on here, so you can click here and then you can uh, watch that uh, video. So uh, let's um, um, talk about today's topic. And um, today's topic is uh, distribution. Or you can say the, the in the four P's it's called placement, but the better word is distribution. Uh, even uh, the distribution is the word is used for uh, services to products. Anything uh, can be called a distribution because um, even services have to be delivered. And when we are talking about delivery, then the service distribution is the service delivery is called distribution and service. So what is distribution, how do we use it, why do we use it, what strategies, how do we think strategically in it, we are going to talk about that. So first let's talk about this, that what is distribution in the first place, why do we need distribution. So we need distribution because we would like to go to the customer and get our, and, uh, and give our customers quick and regular, easy, convenient access to our products. Because when we, they will have this access, then they are very likely to buy our product. So uh, in few cases, uh, it will happen that uh, the customer will try to find you, which means the customer will try to find where the product is. Very few cases. Uh, most of the times, it is the company that has to reach the customer and tell them about uh, their product. Uh, you know the famous uh, marketing is called the, the mousetrap fallacy. The mousetrap fallacy in marketing, uh, there's a term for it that if, uh, if you can make a better mousetrap than your neighbor, then the world will make a beaten path to your door. Uh, I'll translate this in English for you. Uh, if you can make a better product than your competitor, then the world, the, the customers will find a way to get to you. Now this is a fallacy which means that this is not true. Rarely ever it is true, most of the time it's not true. So uh, most of the time uh, it happens that uh, uh, the company actually makes an effort to get to the customer, to bring the, the product to the customer. Now how do they do that? Uh, there are many ways to do this. Now the first, the, the simplest way to do it is what is called direct selling which means that you go and you give that product to your customer directly. Now direct selling means that you there is no intermediary involved and you sell directly to your customer. Now when there is no medium involved, it means that either you are going to go from uh, uh, with the door to door technique, which is called the door to door, which means you knock on doors on homes or offices or institutions and you sell your product then and there. So we find uh, those things very common in uh, in, um, in products that uh, that used to be sold a long time back. People used to do that. Uh, you can say door to door are also the town criers, those the people that sell vegetables and food, and uh, sometimes ice cream in front of our home. They are kind of direct sellers as well, but uh, uh, not ice cream, but all because they don't sell their own ice cream, but uh, at least vegetables and uh, and fruit. So they uh, sell those directly. They don't have any intermediary involved. And then uh, we have uh, uh, other means, which means that we have we have a, a company that. Uh, uh, sells directly to
to, for example, I, I'll give you a good example, a case in fact of uh, Avon. Avon uh, was a, a company uh, uh, that was not doing well in cosmetics in America. And uh, then uh, a CEO changed in, uh, there was a new CEO in the, in the company whose name was Andrea Jung. So she was the first uh, female CEO and uh, what she did is that she said that uh, people who are, uh, who, uh, who buy our products are women. So when uh, we are, when uh, the, the customers are women, then the sellers should also be women. So she changed uh, this for the first time and she actually changed the whole scenario because she went door to door. She actually employed an, a huge number of saleswomen who go door to door to people in in, uh, in their homes and they sold cosmetics then and there to these uh, women. And uh, that actually created uh, a big impact because in the supermarkets when there were um, usually when uh, women went to buy cosmetics, the, the point of sale had huge investment involved. And the only the brands that had huge investments to to have very fancy kiosks or uh, very uh, fancy uh, merchandising techniques uh, with huge investment in the in, in in the section of cosmetics, only they were able to catch the attention of the customers. But that was changed by Avon because even though it was a small brand as compared to the others, it made a difference and it started to get attention. That was one uh, direct, that is one direct selling um, method that works for us. So direct selling works sometimes, but you have to see how and really, because direct selling is, can be quite expensive when you are selling uh, to a, a huge number of people and you are sending in people individually, then uh, it's, it's a huge cost. So you might be using, you might want to use it uh, for a limited time period to get your brand known to the people and then you can shift to uh, the regular um, approaches in distribution. So uh, after direct selling, then we can uh, go for uh, a different uh, channel distribution strategy, which means that we have a channel to get our product to our customer. And when we have a channel, we, uh, that channel has intermediary, or what we can say, there's another word for it, middlemen. Uh, middlemen or intermediaries are those people who are, who actually uh, take our product to our customer. They can be retailers, they can be wholesalers, they can be distributors, they can be depots, they can be stockists. So these are different types of uh, intermediaries. Let's just quickly go over them so that we can know uh, who, who is who and what, who does what. So the easiest one is the is the retailer. Now the retailer is the uh, the entity who actually sells to the consumer. Now this retailer may be uh, a physical retail or it can be an online retail as well. In, in the online retail, usually we see that the online retailer has a, uh, and uh, is working with a vendor who, who distributes those things physically to the customer, who brings those physically to the customer. For example, there are in an online retail, and uh, but the, the one who actually delivers to your home may not be the Daraz person. He may, if that person might be from TCS. So TCS is, uh, works as a vendor for the RAS, but still uh, TCS is not selling you that product, the RAS is selling. So the difference is this, that even though you are interacting directly with the person, the person who is giving you the, the physical object and taking the money might be a TCS guy, but that TCS guy does not own that product. So the ownership still lies with the RAS until you pay for it. So uh, the the shift of the product from uh, the ownership of the product is shift from 
uh, one entity to another. If there is no shifting in the uh, ownership, then that is not a shift in in the channel, and therefore we cannot consider that distributor or or that vendor who is who is physically taking that product to be a retailer. So the retailer is is always that person who is selling to the consumer. The word retail actually uh, means to break, and uh, uh, when we are uh, uh, talking about retail, so the question is this: that uh, why do we call it? Uh, why do we have? Um, uh, why do we call it retail when when it means to break? What are we breaking here? So uh, retailers uh, in the in in the very primitive times of 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 trade, uh, what happened is that ships used to come from uh, um, remote areas to to sell products. Usually, the popular products were like spices and all of these things and grains and uh, other commodities. So people uh, who were business and traders who they used to buy from these people who were uh, who came from the ship and then they used to buy these things in bulk. And then they broke this bulk into smaller quantities. Like for example taking fifty kilograms uh, uh of uh, bags of rice and then breaking them into one kilos or two kilos of a pack. So that's how they broke bulk. That's why they came to be known as retailers, those who are breaking. So retailers are the ones who take from who take products in large quantities and then they break them into smaller quantities and then they sell them to the consumer. Uh, next, we have these wholesalers. Wholesalers are those who are who sell uh, to retailers or other any other intermediaries. They stay in one place. The wholesalers do not move, and uh, they usually buy uh, products directly from the producers. And they and they usually have warehouses in which they keep these things and they sell in wholesale. But it's not. Uh, necessary that a wholesaler uh, cannot sell to the uh, the retail uh, to the consumer. Uh, sometimes, for example, if you go to a metro, you will see that it's written that it's a wholesaler and retailer. It's a wholesale; it sells to retailers and it sells to customers. That's a wholesaler. Then we have a distributor. A distributor is an agent that moves and takes the products from the producers to the uh, retailers. So a distributor is uh, uh, is the one that moves uh, as compared to a wholesaler. So obviously when it's moving, which means that it's incurring the uh, transportation cost as compared to the wholesaler, where the retailer has to go and buy these products. So the distributor has a larger percentage as compared to wholesalers. They usually don't have uh, warehouses or big warehouses because they are they just take uh, they have enough uh, space to keep things for uh, the time that they have to distribute it. So uh, smaller warehouses, larger profit margin. And uh, because distributors usually take the uh, entity, they are the ownership of the entity of the product. Uh, therefore, the distributors have a higher operational uh, risk, which means that if any product is damaged during the process of transportation, then the distributor usually bears the cost of that. Um, unlike uh, the retailers, in, in Pakistan, usually the retailers do not take the responsibility of uh, damaged products or expired products, uh, but the distributor does take that responsibility. Uh, uh, then we have uh, depots and stockists. So now, depots and stockists are are uh, different entities than distributors because and wholesalers because depots are actually uh, you can say 
डिस्ट्रीब्यूटेड वेयर हाउसेज वेयर हाउस इन द विसिनिटी ऑफ अ रिटेलर and the depots are usually made because when sometimes retailers need product on the go they need it and we don't really we cannot anticipate the need of these products in advance so what we do is that we create these depots so that if there is a a, a, a sudden uh, demand that is that is that has increased in a particular area then they do not need to wait for the distributor because the distributor is usually has large vehicles and they do not travel all the time they will probably move maybe once in a week or even once in a month only distributors for things that are uh, distributed daily like bread and other things are uh, have smaller vehicles usually they have larger vehicles so uh, they make depots for example we have depots for uh, for bread uh when we have uh, uh, we know that there are there are you can see that in about a 3 4 km radius you will find at least two to three depots of these uh, cold drink manufacturers and they they hold the uh, different they hold a, a larger uh, quantity of uh, these products because whenever a retailer is, uh, is short of these products then they can buy it from the depot near them or they can transfer uh, transport this uh, to the retailer so this also is a good way to uh, to ensure that the supply of the product is there uh, and without uh, having the distributor go again and again for and uh, for just one retailer then we have a, a, a somebody called a stockist uh now a stockist is a person who is, uh, a, a stockist is an entity an intermediary whose uh, primary job is to stock the product mean which means that this entity is very close to a warehouse but it has a difference between a warehouse a warehouse is any place that only stores the product it doesn't own the product does it doesn't uh, take the responsibility of the well being of the product that it will remain safe and and all of that it doesn't do anything it just stores that product that's it and for storing that product it charges a certain amount to the company un unless the company owns the warehouse so the warehouse is only there for storing the product um the stockist however Uh, has a different kind of uh, uh, function. Stockists are usually uh, used when we have a product that is coming from another geographical location. For example, there is a factory that sells products that that makes these products and then sends them to every city. But it does so in large quantities. Uh, then we have, for example, rice. the rice is uh, transported in huge quantities and then we have the stockers who stock this these uh, huge amounts of rice or any other for example shoes shoes there are uh, stockers of shoes as well they uh, shoes the rice from uh, from the, the port and then there are stockers who keep these shoes and then they distribute then uh, the the retailers they take these shoes as they would as they want in the in their respective quantities from these stockers now uh, the a question arises in mind that why do we have stockers when we can just have warehouses we can just put them in a warehouse and ask those people to get it from the warehouse now the stockist is different because the stockist actually helps in sales which means that the stockist um uh, promotes your product helps you to deliver to different retailers um uh, while a warehouse will not do that you will make the sale in the case of a warehouse while in the case of a stockist it might be possible that that stockist says that i have um 20 retailers who come to me every day and you can just put your stock here and if the retailers want they can take it so they will promote your product 
and uh, and send them to the um, to the um, to the retailer. Uh, I'll give you an example of a uh, of, uh, of a good strategy that I saw in case of a stock and this a good distribution strategy. So there was a company that um, sold uh, a marble products and ceramics and, and on, on those things. And um, they used to sell these products to, uh, all over the world because Pakistan exports uh, marble and these things. So uh, their primary market was uh, U.S. And <laughs> Okay. So um, you guys can hear me, right? Um, because nobody has spoken for a while. That's why I'm asking. Yes, sir, we can hear you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so that company actually sold these marble tiles to this uh, to US, and uh, but the problem is that marble is a heavy product. Uh, it's very heavy, so because it's stone basically. So it's it's not easy to transport huge quantities of uh, marble on uh, an airplane. Usually, you will see, and it's very costly as well if you go if you send it by an airplane. Uh, rather than that, uh, usually it is shipped to uh, these locations, and when they are using shipping then it means that uh, a flight that takes about uh, 24 hours to get from to, from Pakistan to USA will take at least uh, 25 days to in a ship to get there. So if somebody orders um, um, about a, a, even a thousand pieces of marble uh, or two thousand pieces of tiles of marble, and they, they give an order, and then there is a lead time for that, because in the order is placed, then you have to produce it. So then there is the order time. Firstly, the order is received. Um, uh, then it is confirmed. Then maybe some payment is made. And then uh, and there is the lead time, which means the time from the order to the delivery time. So the lead time includes the manufacturing time. So let's say uh, 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 it's also important to note that marble cannot be produced without an order easily. It can be produced, but it's not very easy because you don't really know how the person is going to order, what size they want. So, uh, so usually they used to wait for an order, and when the order came, then they started cutting these tiles on the rock. And then they converted into tiles. It, it took about 15 days time, and then another 25 days. So about in about 50 days time, two months time, uh, the products were delivered from Pakistan to you. Now they found out that uh, slowly their market share was decreasing, and uh, even though the demand for marble had not decreased, the still the uh, uh, their their uh, sales were going down. So when they did some market research, they found out that uh, the 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 stockists who uh, there there were some companies in America who were uh, basically Indians who who were purchasing these this marble tiles from India. And they used to store these marble tiles there in America in a warehouse. And when somebody wanted to order these tiles, they just uh, took out these tiles from uh, from their warehouse and then they delivered it within a day or two or three, maximum in, in a week time, anywhere in USA. So uh, it it was. Uh, um, very weird that how is how is this possible, how is this working and they were taking all the market share. So they found out that what their strategy was that they found out the most popular orders that were given. And they found the, out the most popular sizes of the of the marble uh, product. 
and they they made those popular sizes in those product popular products and then they just shifted them beforehand to USA in a warehouse. So uh, what happened then when whenever there was a demand coming, they asked if these these warehouses if they have these products. And usually the because they were so popular, they usually had those tiles already there. And it just took them a day or two to deliver them. So the time shifted from about 50 days to just a week time. And that shifted uh, uh, the whole uh, market from from uh, buying Pakistani quality uh, product, marble products to the Indians, which uh, didn't have that much quality, but at least they were being delivered in a week. So in order to save time, the whole thing was shifting. So then the Pakistani company also made a stock kiss. They, they employed a stockist in America who would take these products, keep those marble tiles with them, and then whenever there was an order, then they used to route them to the stockist that we have this stockist here, there in America, and you can buy the things from them. And then if you want more, then we, we will, uh, meanwhile, you can use these tiles, and then you have another uh, Consignment, then we can make that consignment while you take these products from our stockist. So the stockist here was a key factor in uh, in the distribution of product and reducing the uh, lead time from about 50 days to a week's time. So uh, one great example of how distribution strategy can make a big difference. Uh, then we have uh, then we have understood that these are different uh, ways that you can uh, make a channel. Uh, so we we need to understand that there is not one sure way to do it, or there is there is no uh, perfect way to do this. You can employ you can make a channel by using. Um, um, a wholesaler plus distributor plus um, retailer, or you can have many distributors, or you can have wholesalers, or you can have a, a very small limited distributors, and then you can have many retailers. Now the the how can I have a question to you? Yes, please. So, sir, uh, sometimes we listen to the uh, we have a, a broker a broker in this channel. So they are also like a retailer and wholesaler. So, so what are their roles? Sir? They are calling to the retailer or the wholesaler? Or a no, none, none of these. Actually, all of these uh, take the ownership of the product. Uh, the wholesalers and distributors uh, and the retailers, they take the ownership of the product. When they are paying for the product to their respective suppliers. But in the case of broker, which is also called an agent or a broker, that uh, entity never takes the ownership, the title which is called, the title of the product. Uh, usually, it, uh, the agent only uh, connects to uh, two entities, two intermediaries. Their job is only to uh, uh, to just connect to make a, a transaction between two entities. For example, a broker might be uh, connecting a retailer with a certain uh, uh, distributor. Uh, now, why would a broker be needed? The, the question arises, why would a broker be needed? Why doesn't the distributor directly sell to the retailer? So, a broker might be needed when the information is about a certain product is not available to everybody, and um, also this is this is this might be possible that the distribution is limited, which means that there is something that is only uh, that the distributor has the rights to sell that product; others cannot do it. Uh, so. The broker is required to make sure that there is a certain retailer who qualifies for to to uh, to receive that product. 
and uh, therefore that broker can be there. Um, usually this happens only when information is, is restricted in a market. That's where we need agents. Like uh, for example, uh, uh, the real estate industry, we have brokers, typical brokers in the real estate industry because the information is not there. When we are trying to sell a house, uh, when uh, then not everybody knows that we are trying to sell a house. If we people knew that, then they would not need a broker. That's why a broker is there to actually uh, to to compensate for the restriction in information. But that's not uh, a part of the distribution channel. No, not typically a part. Okay, so let's move on and uh, let's talk about um, let's talk about uh, the criterion that we need. For example, firstly, we have to understand that what are the basic strategies uh, in distribution. We have three main basic strategies. We can have an intensive uh, distribution strategy, or we can have an exclusive distribution strategy, or we can have uh, selective distribution strategy. The intensive distribution strategy means that uh, our product is made available to every corner of our target market. Every place, everywhere, every contact point, it's there everywhere. Now this type of strategy is usually followed by uh, FMCGs or those products that are uh, sold at multiple uh, kinds of retailers, uh, like uh, biscuits are sold in uh, bakeries and sold in general stores and uh, even pharmacies or uh, kiriana stores or pan shops, uh, they are sold on in all of these places. You will find stationery to be sold uh, by a lot of people. In fact, uh, there is a good uh, case of uh, dollar uh, stationery in Pakistan, who actually had a selective um, uh, distribution strategy. Now, in, in, uh, the selective distribution strategy is the one in which the company selects only specific uh, dis uh, retailers where the product will be available. Now, they do that because they they want their product to be uh, to not be wasted, basically. They don't want the product to be wasted. So, uh, if, if, for example, if we put a, a, a juice pack in uh, uh, at the milk shop, uh, in the milk shop, it is is very unlikely that uh, that uh, juice will be bought. Unlikely, less likely. So, um, a lot of juice packs will be discarded and uh, when they get expired and that will be a lot of wastage. So uh, that problem can be solved by having selective uh, distribution systems. Usually we see that selective distribution systems are used uh, by pharma companies or uh, electronic appliances. Uh, we don't see electronic appliances everywhere. We see them only in particular shops or mobile phones or these kinds of products. So uh, Dollar Stationery also had this uh, um, also had this uh, selective distribution uh, strategy in which they were going for stationeries uh, and uh, and only supermarkets. So this, they they only sold their product on stationers and supermarkets, and uh, sometimes in uh, in other gift uh, shops. Uh, but then uh, they realize something. They realize that they can put their products in in other uh, retailers as well. They can put them in in at the general stores. They can put them in marts. They can put them in uh, even the pawn shops. So what they did is that they changed their selective distribution channels to an, an intensive distribution strategy. 
and then they started giving these products to everybody. Firstly, they re they received a lot of resistance. These retailers were very resistant, saying that we are not a stationer, so why should we keep this? The reason that they gave was that number one, they they the product that they were selling were they could not be wasted. They could not. They were not perishable items because a pencil or a, a pencil color or a fountain pen. Uh, all of these things uh, do not uh, perish or they do not deteriorate with time. So the first thing was this that they can keep them, and if they don't, uh, there there is no sale, then they can uh, uh, they can just give it back. There is no problem. Uh, the second thing was that they uh, had gave them a bigger profit margin. So when they saw that a larger profit margin, they actually gave them about 33% profit margin on on stationary items for these pan shops and all of these. This this is actually larger than uh, most of the products that they usually sell. So they just uh, out of uh, you know just experimentation, they bought these products. They they kept these products with them. So uh, uh, this um, helped them to uh, yeah. uh, this helped them to um, um, to gain a larger access uh, uh, to all of these um, uh, different types of retailers, and uh, their sales absolutely boomed. But that that's not the only thing that their sales also sustained. It's not that they initially the sales went up and then they went down because nobody was buying these things. Because these products were there visible in in many of these retailers, then people actually started doing impulse buying. They went to the into the general store and they saw a stationer's item and they remembered that they were they had to buy a all point or a glue tube or any such thing and when they remembered this then they just picked it up and uh, this type of strategy worked for them because it was uh, sell it wasn't selective but it was very intensive in nature and it worked only because the product was not perishable if you employ the same strategy in a product that is perishable like ice cream or juices or milk or yogurt or soft drinks, uh, then probably this will not work. So you need to have a, an, an intensive distribution strategy only uh, when you are confident that your product is not going to be wasted and it, even if it is, is not selling, then you can take it back. So uh, that's um, the uh, the, dis the comparison between the intensive and the selective distribution strategies. Then we have another strategy which is called the exclusive uh, distribution strategy. Exclusive distribution strategy means that you only give access to your uh, to products to a specific retailers or specific distributors, not everybody. Now, why would you do that? Why would you want to restrict your um, uh, your access. You would want to give more access, uh, as logically speaking. Uh, but you give these access to uh, a few customers because you want it to be known as a luxury item that only few people, a specific target market, can have. So this strategy works for uh, for products like uh, watches. They have, uh, if there is a, a, an elite brand that sells only uh, a, a very expensive watches, then they will not want the access to be there for everybody. They will have a very exclusive distribution channel in which there will be a distributor who actually pays a lot of money to get that distribution license from them. So firstly, they will uh, actually make money from the license itself. And then they will give this um, 
the the authority to sell this product to very few uh, people, so very few distributors, and that will give the perception of it being a luxurious item. This can go for uh, automobiles as well. You see that you know if it's it's not possible that I go to Toyota and I say that I would like to sell Toyota myself and I'm going to open a showroom of Toyota uh, by myself. So it's not possible. They have to have a license from Toyota and they will not give this license to everybody because that will ruin the uh, exclusive uh, thing or that Toyota has. That it's there with a few people, only those who have that have that carry, that can carry the image of the brand. They can have, they do have the capacity to deliver the product properly with the standards that have been uh, given to them. So exclusive distribution channel works for such products in which we want to restrict our um uh, our access to these customers and we want to have uh, certain standards to be in place then we go ahead with exclusive uh, distribution system and uh, then we have um uh um the criterion of once we've understood i hope everybody has understood there is any question you can ask now then we'll discuss the criterion that we use to select these this strategies. If there is any question, you can ask. No question? You can hear me, right? Okay, so no questions. So let's talk about um, the criterion. When, when I'm saying about the criteria that we are using, it means that the, how do we know which strategy is best for us? How do we know? So what we do is that we have to consider something. For example, let's start with the company itself. What is the... Um, uh, what are the core competencies of the company? Uh, for example, if we take uh, Nestle. So, uh, Nestle in Pakistan has a core competency that it has, it is uh, vertically integrated, which means that it owns these uh, farms, dairy farms, it owns the factory, it owns the vehicles that, tra that transport these uh, milk from the farmers to the factories to the retailers and all of these things. So it is very much vertically integrated. So the company's one of the core competencies of Nestle is that it has, um, um, it is vertically integrated and secondly it has uh, very strict standards when it comes to uh, the quality of milk that they collect from the farmers and the devices that they use to to maintain the standard they uh, they have to they uh, measure the fat content in ev from every farmer and they use these standards to make sure that all the milk that is collected uh, from any any farm is is the same has the same fat content so when they're doing that it means that they are able to uh, carry a distribution strategy that is very much intense because they own this these channels. It's convenient for them to use these channels to go anywhere and, and distribute them intensively. Uh, so the first uh, thing is, is considering the company's own core competencies. If the company does not have these core competencies, it is using a third-party vendor to produce anything, then they might have to go for a selective uh, distribution strategy because they don't, uh, they cannot have a large supply chain so they can distribute everything easily or, or, or uh, in, in case of a reverse supply chain, if their product has to be called back, then 
they still have to have a huge uh, fleet to get those things back. So it will be very costly for them to have a larger fleet. Therefore, they will be going for a selective uh, distribution channel. Uh, when we are talking about a uh, uh, company, we have to consider that the company also has competitors, which means that another criteria that we will, criterion that we will be using is the is looking at the competitor. Now, why do we see the competitor? Because it, it might be possible that we have a selective distribution channel, but our competitor has a, an intensive distribution channel. Uh, um, the typical example would be Pepsi versus Coke. Uh, Pepsi has a very intensive distribution channel as compared to Coke. Coke usually goes, uh, does not go for every restaurant. It usually goes for uh, typical general stores and retailers and um, and those kinds of places, uh, institutions. Uh, but uh, you will see Pepsi everywhere in restaurants. So um, uh, their strategy is different. Coke actually tries to maintain its quality and therefore it doesn't uh, go for every uh, restaurant because uh, usually we see the there are fake uh, soft drinks that are uh, used by these uh, restaurants uh, because they save money. So uh, that they, they use that a lot, and that's why Coke wants to avoid that. They go for a rather selective distribution channel. So they use they they have this policy uh, seeing the competitors' uh, problems. So we have to see if the comparator is doing so, if we need to match it or if we should be different from it, what should be our policy, we have to consider that. So the first was company, the second was comparator, and the third is the product nature, which means that we have to understand if the product is perishable, what the product shelf life is, what its expiry life is. Uh, there is a difference between the shelf life and the expiry life because uh, the shelf life means that it can stay on the shelf of the retailer for that time. The expiry means that once it is opened, then uh, then how much can it uh, it, um, if it is sold? Sorry, uh, then uh, how much can it last? So or both these lives of the product are to be considered. Is it a perishable product? It, it can it be transferred? Uh, transported easily, can it be stagged easily, can it be uh, recalled easily, can, uh, does, is it temperature uh, uh, sensitive, all of these uh, uh, factors have to be considered because when we are going for an intensive distribution channel, we have to know that the vehicles that will be taking our products will not be the same if we are going for intensive distribution channels. They will not be the same because everywhere in, in Pakistan we do not have the same kinds of roads. If we are going for areas that are remote in the northern areas, then we do not, we cannot have large trucks uh, or containers going to uh, hilly areas and distributing these products. We have to have uh, the pickups and these uh, and smaller trucks that take these products. So the um, uh, the vehicles will not be the same, and hence it will not be uh, easy to uh, transport uh, the uh, product that uh, that is usually transported in a container to shift it to a uh, to a truck. If it is if it's sensitive to light, for example. Uh, some pharma products are sensitive to light. If they are transported in an open truck, then they will probably be wasted before they reach the retailer. Or uh, vaccines that are uh, transported and uh, have to be kept cold and they cannot be transported that easily. Um, or um, Products like ice cream, they are in. Uh, they have to be transported in reefers, and they cannot be uh, transported over a lar larger distance uh, in a single go. So um, it's, it's 
difficult to uh, to go for intensive distribution strategies unless you have your own fleet unless you have a large investment in the in the vehicle so uh, you have to consider then the company's own competencies and the product nature and then we have to understand the market dynamics how quickly uh, is the market changing is it uh, uh, is the is is the transportation uh, costs um, are are they fluctuating all the time do we have the same kind of call do we have a contract that goes for years or do we have to uh, take these vehicles from the market on a on a given basis uh if the if the petrol prices go up the the cost also go up very quickly so we have to consider the market dynamics are they changing or are they stable if they are stable then we can go easily for intensive distribution if they are not stable then we should go for exclusive or self selective kind of distribution channel usually we see that exclusive uh, distribution channels are only used uh when uh, you are using some third party kind of vendor that you don't really cannot really rely on so you cannot uh, make sure that your product is always there on time so you go only for exclusive distribution you cannot go for intensive because um uh, it is bound to be late somewhere sometime um uh, therefore we use exclusive when when we are using third party vendors uh then we have um uh, we've uh, we've covered uh, the market dynamic and we've covered um the um the middleman yeah uh the middleman uh, that we have uh are all have to be considered how many middlemen that we have for example uh, uh english biscuits uh, has about uh, 400 distributors so they have a large number of distributors that they use and uh, therefore it is very easy for them to have an intensive distribution channel because they if one distributor fails then they have uh, they can just go ahead with another they have probably have uh areas that they have covered even if 20 or 30 distributors uh the the stop distributing uh, immediately even then they will be able to distribute these products everywhere so the number of distributors you have the types of distributors you have the capacities of the distributors that you have employed all of this is important when considering the type of uh, strategy when you have a huge fleet uh, with proper distributors or your own vehicles and uh, there is not flex- much fluctuation then you should go for an intensive distribution strategy then we have um uh, the uh, customer uh, uh, characteristics which means that um uh, the um customers uh, how do they behave uh, do they uh, only buy products from uh, certain uh, retailers or certain uh, kinds of retailers from certain geographical areas for example if i ask you that if you have to buy furniture a table for example you have to buy a table and you go to um Uh, to a place uh, near your uh, home and you find and, and you ask if there is a, a furniture shop nearby and the person asks you okay, what you want and you say i want to buy a table and that uh, retailer sells uh, toys and he said that we also sell tables and you will be surprised but the question is will you buy a table from this toy shop so it's it possible that you will not be considering buying the table from the toy shop even if he offers a good price even if the table looks good looks cheap and his and is of good quality still you would be resistant to buy from a toy shop because of your own thinking that a 
table should be bought from a furniture shop. If there is some problem, then how would I go and ask this toy maker about this about this table? So uh, the customer characteristics, which means that uh, the uh, how do the customers behave? What things are they considering? Do they uh, want to buy it from exclusive uh, places or do they want to buy it from anywhere? Uh, for example, there might be products that can be sold uh, in in smaller areas, uh, in in uh, in smaller retailers uh, like crockery, for example. If you go and buy crockery, then you can buy it from anywhere in a in a shop that sells crockery, but it's uh, more convenient for you to buy it from a larger shop that has a larger variety of crockery and you can go and pick those things up and look at them yourself and then decide what you want to buy. It might be convenient for you. So you have to understand what the customer wants. If that is so, then we will go for a distribution channel that that uses larger uh, retailers in terms of geographic, larger retailers instead of smaller retailers. But if the, uh, the, uh, the uh, people are not sensitive about it, they would buy it from anywhere, then uh, then it's fine. Uh, we also see that uh, these customers tend to buy some products from uh, the known market. For example, there is a known market for um, for sports goods, uh, if you want to buy sports goods, then you go to uh, a particular area and so that if you want to buy electronic items, then you go to cooperative market. If you want to buy luggage, you go to Gold Plaza. So uh, these uh, markets are there and the distribution strategy of these, for example, a luggage company should be to sell this product more to to the retailers that are there near Gold Plaza. Their strategy will be very, very intensive there rather than being selective. So they might be selective elsewhere, but they will be very intensive when it comes to that market. And uh, uh, then we have the uh, channel compensation. The last uh, the criteria is the channel compensation, which means that uh, you have to understand which channel is more expensive for us. For example, in a particular kind of product, the, uh, a retailer takes 10% um, of, uh, of the margin. Uh, the distributor takes 7% uh, of the margin. The wholesaler takes 5% of the margin. But the wholesaler is also a retailer. So if we are selling to a, a wholesaler and uh, who is also a retailer, then uh, the the customer will be able to get that product at a much lesser price, even though it costs us the same. So the compensation for the wholesaler is much less as compared to the uh, the, the the way that distribute the. Uh, the channel that we are using distributor for. It has a, a larger compensation for the middleman as compared to the wholesaler plus retailer. So if that is so, then we would want to promote that uh, channel. Because even if you don't like make uh, the money, uh, still it will be cheaper for the customer and they will want to buy it more. So the channel compensation it has to be considered when we are doing that. If that is so, if if we have that, uh, if we have a cheaper channel that's available to us, then we should use it more as compared to other channels. And we should have a, a more uh, selective kind of uh, distribution channel that we are using for uh, that product, which has less compensation for the middleman. So that would cost us less. So uh, when we are uh, in summing it all up, we will we we'll look at uh, the mark, the uh, company, the company's core competencies. Then we we'll look at the competitors' uh, choices that they are doing and and reflect on that. 
then we are going to see the product nature, uh, what kind of product it is. Then we are going to see the uh, the market environment, the market dynamics. Then we are going to see the customer characteristics that uh, the how the customers behave and uh, what they are doing. And then we are going to see the uh, channel compensation, how much the channels are costing to us. When we are doing all that, then we can decide the right strategy for us. If we should go for direct selling, if we should go for a channel distribution, what kind of channel distribution, what should be the hierarchy, how many distributors, and all of these things. Now, these things can be only truly understood when you actually see them in a case. So, what I'd like you to do is that go and search for some cases. I'll also send you some cases. I've, I've taken some cases and I'll uh, send them to you. And you read how they have uh, employed these strategies uh, looking at the different types of uh, the criteria. And then you can understand how the distribution strategies are in place. That will help you. So uh, that's about uh, today's um, lecture and uh, if you have any questions uh, please go ahead and ask. We also have started us for one with us if you, sir, if you want to ask anything or say anything to our students. <coughs> sir, I have a question. Yes. What text is the current speaker? Okay. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. We can hear you. Hello? Yes, sir. We can hear you. <coughs> sir, uh, it's the first time that I'm uh, ending your online class, and, uh, and it's, it feels great. And Masha, I think you, you have covered quite a much, uh, uh, topic in a very, uh, I would say, in a very easiest manner. The examples were excellent. And, uh, I hope the students who are listening, uh, are understanding all the concepts. And, uh, I just want to add, uh, something up. Uh, just want to help the students out a little bit. Hmm. Uh, there's something which, uh, talked about the environmental factors analysis and uh, the environmental factor, how can we remember them? Um, <coughs> let me, uh, let me, if you will allow me, I will let me message you uh, the three pictures so that you can get to share it uh, with, uh, with this room so that they would be able to remember the environmental factors. You are, and are actually talking about the environmental factors and the, uh, one of them uh, includes the distributors and the suppliers and the uh, general public and the stakeholders and all that, oh. right? So let me uh, send you this sort of, yes. uh, yes, few, classroom. Um, let's say, pictures that you can get to. Uh, you can get to share it in the in the classroom. Let me let me just uh, let me just message you so that uh, if you can get to share with your students, that would be great. Hmm. <laughs> Thank you, sir. That would be great. So, uh, Ahmed, you wanted to ask something. Uh, yes, sir, I had one question, actually, um, mm -hmm. like, for example, if we have Kiryana stores or Pathan ki Dukan, as we call them, uh, at every corner of every <laughs> like in a commercial. So, um, the question is, like, for example, if I talk about my mother, my mother does not have any such activity because she's a housewife, and she likes to go for grocery shopping once a month. So, obviously, she goes to the supermarkets like Nahid and Impiyaz and these kind of places. So, but we see that a huge quantity of rice, sugar, and tea is sold on these Kiryana stores. So, uh, these kind of products have versatile market. Like, people go to mega stores to buy them also, and people go to these Kiryana shops also. So, how can we differentiate between the 
type of product that we have so that we can segment the target market and uh, choose the right person for that. For example, the wholesaler, the stock is the retailer according to that. Right. So uh, the um, the criteria actually is the same that we have to consider all the the, the customer's preferences. We have to see where the customer prefers to buy our product. For example, uh, usually with the, when we are uh, going to a supermarket, we will probably, if we are buying rice, for example, we might buy a 5 kg pack. But when we are going to a Kiryana store, we will mm, very rarely this would happen that we would buy. If, if maybe if it, even if it's uh, possible that it's not even there. The 5 kg rice pack will not even be there at the Kiryana store. So, uh, similarly, if you are going to the Yana's store to buy shampoo, you will find the sashes that will be available there, but you will not find sashes in, at the Nike store. So, uh, the range of the product that we are selling changes according to the channel, and therefore, we choose a different combo for these different channels. We have intensive distribution for... Um, we will have for intensive distribution for the 1 kilogram and 2 kilogram packs of rice and selective distribution channel for the 5 kilogram pack. Similarly, it's a very intensive distribution for the sachets of shampoos and uh, uh, selective distribution for the, uh, the larger uh, 750 ml uh, bottles of shampoo. So we will uh, mix it all the time. Yeah, I understood. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else who wants to ask any questions? <laughs> Sir, I have just shared with you the uh, three pictures. Okay. Maybe if you would like to share this with these students. Yes, yes, I will definitely share. I just switched uh, you. Okay. I'll, I'll just see it. And I'll share it on Google Classroom, and I will also share a YouTube link of this video. Uh, then you can see it later as well. Uh, also prepared for the exam through this. So, um, so that's that. And uh, in next time, uh, be sure to keep taking the Google Classroom because I'll be sending you at least one assignment and one quiz uh, during this week. So uh, till then, and then we'll see. I'll see you next week uh, at the uh, almost the same time. We'll just start after Marid, so that uh, we can uh, everybody can be here. So till then, uh, Allah is everybody. Okay, sir. Allah Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure. Thank you, sir. Last is.